Okay. As you see on the slides that today's class will be on constructing cultures, the politics of travelers still. We know that in literature, there are several formats of writing or in another sense, it, this can be called genre, J-E-N-R-E, -E, genre. We have novel, drama, poetry, historical writing, and also there are some travelogue. These are the formats of literature. In case of competitive literature, two literatures, two kinds of literature written in two languages can be compared. Apart from that, uh, some literature is written based on the culture of the dominating countries. That is another issue. And another issue is that many people at the time of imperialism or at the time of colonialism, many adventurers, they spread it many parts of the world. They have noticed some thing related to the culture of the countries where they have visited and they have written the memories. These are called the traveler's tales. However, when a person belonging to a culture, he will be writing in a way. But if a person comes from a different culture and notices the thing that will be happening within the uh, within different culture, that is another view. We will be discussing all the matters uh, in today's class. In this regard, first, we have to talk about Michel Foucault. You have heard the name of this French philosopher. Foucault was a French philosopher, historian of ideas, social theorist, and literary critic as well. Foucault's theories primarily address the relationship between power and knowledge, however, and how they are used as a form of social control, how power and knowledge may control the social form through the societal institution. Uh, this is the focus of Michel Foucault's philosophy, relation between knowledge and power. This man, this philosopher's critic commented that there are only two forms of comparison in cage of competitive literature. Comparison of measurement who is analyzes into units in order to establish relations of equality and inequality. And that of the other, who is establishes the simplest elements and arranges differences, comparative uh, differences. Comparative literary study has tended in the past to be overly concerned with the first type of comparison. That means the comparison of measurement establishes relations of equality and inequality. Setting up canons of primary and secondary authors, comparison between primary and secondary authors of a text, greater and lesser text, a stronger and weaker culture, a strong culture, that means more dominating culture, and weak culture, less dominating culture. 
or less prominent culture. Majority and minority languages. Majority, the, people, the language which is used by major number of people and the minor, minority language, the people, the language is used by less number of people all over the world. And trying hard to keep the ideological implication such as hierarchization out of sight. So according to Foucault, the first kind of comparison in competitive literature is the comparison of measurement. The second type of comparison, one of the most significant development most recently Comparative literary study involves a change in our readings. That is the second type of comparison, Michel Foucault claimed. That is the accounts of journeys, of the diaries, letters, translation, and tales told by travelers of their experience of other cultures. As I had talked about the initial stage of today's class, that the travelers travel from one country to another, from one culture to another, and they have written some experience of journeys. They have written diaries, letters, and such kind of diaries and letters and journeys or travelogue can, has become another important field of competitive literature and also translation. Apart from that, translation, uh, a writer may, may translate the literature and that is the another form of competitive literature according to Michel Foucault. First category, competition of measurement they, that will be comparing two cultures based on equality and inequality. And second type that is the travel or we can say the accounts of journeys, diaries, letters and etc. In this regard, uh, Columbus accounts of his voice uh, of the new world is full as uh, Trodop has pointed out. This is Trodop, Bulgarian French historian, uh, philosopher, structuralist, literary critic, sociologist, and essayist. He was the author of many books and essays and which have had a significant influence in anthropology, sociology, semiotics, literary theory, intellectual history, and cultural theory. This is Todorov. Todorov has come up with the idea about, pointed out the reference of magic word oro. Oro means gold. Where gold failed to materialize, he proceeded further, driven by the certainty that it must be there, just out of reach. Other colonizers expressed their journeys in terms of land cultivation. After the discovery of America by Columbus in 1492, the people is spread it all over the world. One category that the travelers, they had been searching for gold. And if they failed to get gold, they had another intention in their mind. What is the intention? Land cultivation, planting, fertilizing, hoeing, tilling, plowing the land. And recently scholars have begun to point out the equation of this kind in imagery with uh, that of rape. This is a term used by Todorov. How? The virgin colony lying back and waiting to be husbanded, the term. And this very word attract my attention uh, given by uh, Todorov. Todorov said that the virgin colony, that means that colony was not visited earlier by any strangers. And when strangers uh, go there, that country become husbanded. In a pornographic fantasy and records through the accounts of the European seeking and their fortune overseas, the very name of American colony Virginia seemed to inspire a considerable 
number of lewd metaphors. So many parts of the world were uh, unoccupied by many people and the travelers move from one place to another place in, uh, in search of land where they will be cultivating and planting many things. And contemporary readings of accounts of travels inspired by different methodologies driving from the gender studies. And when such kind of movement of the travelers from one place to another, the idea of comparative literature that has shifted to other genres, that is gender studies, cultural studies, postmodernist theories, expose subtext beneath the apparently innocent details of the journey. That means through the journey, the person, the explorer will be describing the journey, but under the apparent story of the journey, there are some hidden meaning and that meaning is called the subtext. Actually, what does it mean metaphorically? Such kind of discussion has come as a prominent field of comparative literature. Travelers construct the cultures they experience. Actually, what the traveler uh, writes, is this the real identity of the culture on who is the traveler is writing in this regard? He said that actually what travelers write, this is not the actual cultural scenario of that country. And for this reason, it is says that travelers construct the cultures they experience. And from travelers account of their journey, we can trace the presence of cultural stereotype, the way in which an individual react to what is seen elsewhere can reflect tendencies in the traveler's home culture. When a traveler visits another country, this uh, experience can be evaluated in such a way that the traveler, he will be writing the story in his own way, what he is, what he has perceived through the nutrition. But it might not be the actual scenery of the culture. It might not be the different, uh, uh, different story behind the culture. And that is, in this regard, uh, Sushan Basnet has come up with a, a um, example, with an example that is Jane Austen, contemporary Mr. J.B. Scott of Bargay, Suffolk, 1792 and uh, 9, 1792 to 1822, first traveled to France and Italy. Okay. J.B. Scott is an American writer. First time he visited France and Italy. And predictably, his journeys are full of anecdotes about Napoleon together, together with the details of the meals he enjoyed on the journey. So in that journey, he has described Europe. So look here, the, an American writer visited Europe. And this is the first hand experience by an American writer. And how he has written. Um, Shushan Basnet has put it as an example here. And the uh, title, uh, this is uh, the actual writing, actually the name of the writing, an Englishman at home and abroad with some recollection of Napoleon being extracted from the details of J.B. Scott's uh, Bargay Suffolk with an appendix. So he has written this. There he has mentioned that the women of Legborn, Legborn is a city of Italy. So he has seen women in Legborn and he has uh, written that the women of Legborn are singularly fair in general much to our surprise for their neighbors of province are almost muta loose. Muta loose means offspring of European and black. So 
father is European and a mother is black. So when a baby will be coming out of such kind of a dual citizenship or dual uh, identical pa parent, like father is European and uh, mother is black. So he has mentioned that most of the women, they have noticed that uh, they are the almost mulattoes. They wear a kind of white veil hanging from the top of their heads. They also mentioned the women, they use a, a, a special kind of long veil in their hands and descending over their shoulders, which looks very pretty. And their earrings are generally of immense size. The Tuscan men are a fine intelligent set of people. Tuscan, that means the birthplace of Italy and Renesha. So where the Renesha was um, uh, started a journey. So the Tuscan men uh, are a, a Tuscan are a fine intelligent set of people. Their hatred of the friends is fully equaled by that the entertained of the uh, Austrians. So this is the history actually. Uh, given by the writer that he said that actually the um, he has noticed most of them are almost mulattoes. Scott follows the fashion of the young Englishman intellectual of this day and like Byron and Shelley supports Italian independence claims uh, from Austria. He is also a young man just down from Cambridge interested in women, commenting regularly on the clothes and appearance of women he observed on his travels. Actually, Scott went to Italy and Europe and found the uh, dress of women and he has commented about the women. Here, we might comment that actually out of many things, Scott commented about the women. That means Scott's preconceived philosophy, preconceived interest of women has come in the discussion of his writing. So uh, that we notice. But there is an anthropological note to this account of the women and men of the Leghorn. But if we go to the anthropological history of this leg, uh, Leghorn, that transform them into objects, creates Creatures who acquire substance because he best, uh, best judge eat upon them. The women have usually large earrings and pretty head gear. The men are fine and intelligent. What he sees and what he assumes are blurred. And his own English patriotism finds its counterpart in what he confidently uh, assures us is hatred for the friends. Actually, uh, through his observation, Scott has claimed that the people living in uh, Leghorn, they are very much hatred, they have hatred for the French people, but such kind of hatred had uh, from the American people. So that philosophy and that culture has been presented in his writing. And who at that point, in the time were commonly seen as the devils of Europe. So Scott moves from the descriptive mood to the statement of the certainty with the confidence of the travelers who knows he is a position of authority vis-a-vis -vis his subjects. So uh, Scott has described something he himself is describing, he has became, he is writing about himself. That means he is writing the uh, his own patriotic notion and also the patriotic notion of the people living in Leghorn, Italy. So this is the bias, such kind of biasness we see in case of writing uh, travelers uh, tales. And we can indeed, uh, indeed learn a great deal from the accounts of the travels. And this may yet prove to be one of the most fruitful areas of comparative study. So such kind of study has become a, a 
important branch of comparative literature and has come to light in recent years. Moreover, uh, an explanation, uh, an examination of the very text produced by travelers shows how prejudices, uh, prejudices stereotypes, negative perception of other cultures can be handed through down through generation. Uh, in recent years, it has become a common notion that uh, comparing a traveler still has become an important issue or branch of comparative literature. But there we have noticed that such kind of uh, cultural stereotype, prejudices, and also negative perception we see in these travelers still. Accounts of journeys can also show us other things about the way in which travelers perceive their place in the world they inhabit. So traveler tales and also the accounts of journey, we see the uh, same scenario uh, uh, in case of journey. Let us take another very different example from another age, an account of a journey by perhaps untypical Englishman through equally a product of his own time. So here there is an Englishman, he made a journey. On Saturday 21st, September 1583, John, Dr. John D, mathematician, philosopher, map, map, uh, map maker and astrolo astrologer to Queen Elizabeth I left England and accompanied by his assistants, Edward Kelly and their families to travel to Krako, Krako in Poland. So this man, John D, he left England and went to Poland. They took sheep from the grape scent and as details in a true and faithful relation of what passed from many years between Dr. John D and some spirits followed in uh, uh, sir, uh, sir, uh, circussion path via uh, uh, Amsterdam up to the Jender G. So this man made a journey and actually his writing uh, uh, then in a series of small boards crossing short, crossing short stretches of water until they come to Ebenden on 7th October, communicating with spirits at different places where they have rested. Actually, he has fascinated with spirit. And for this reason, in a very zigzag way, this man, John D, left England and went to Imbedden. And there, he has uh, written some story that he encountered with several spirits in several parts of his journey. What he has written? D took great care to record both the old style of dates and the new ones he had arrived to Poland. For although the Gregorian calendar was very recent, it had been adopted throughout Catholic Europe and scholars of Protestant countries although refusing to accept what was considered as a papistry reform. The Gregorian calendar was not accepted in England uh, until 1770, uh, 1752. Uh, D made his journey. Why D didn't go directly to Poland? He made the journey in a zigzag way. Here is an observation. What's the observation? Actually, he wanted to discard the Protestant countries and uh, uh, where uh, Protestantism is a prominent form of religion. And he is very much interested to uh, map, map him and uh, the calendars. But the subtext, that means the intention, why he made the journey in a zigzag way, it is that he is, he, um, D was supposed to skip the 
protestant prone or papist uh, country and for this reason he made this journey this interest in calendar reforms marks a shift in his scientific work that appears to coincide with the meeting with the edward kelly who served at his medium in the summoning of spirits and his departure from england for central europe in the 1570 decades a great deal of this time had been spent on map making advising such travelers as martin uh, provisor who was seeking in north passes of cathay and san francis deacon so this is the history of d d was a product of the great age of voyages of discovery the moment when map making became a science rather than an art when the map became an instrument of hegemony hegemony you, we know the dominance so d was very much interested to map making why because the person or the country who can make the map they will be the dominant culture they will be the major culture and for this reason map making became a, an instrument of hegemony the means by which whole civilization could be conquered millions of slaves traded across oceans and the whole patterns of social relations altered irrevocably as mary hammer says map making signifies a process of massive change so this is the story of d's journey from england to poland the very activities of measuring ordering regulating and standardizing the production of accuracy that is the prerequisite of scale mapping involve rigorous uh, shaping of the material world that is at odds with an align to the forms in which the material world has uh, has its prior existence but d moved away from map making and shifted his focus to the problems of measuring time and dates so another uh, issue came in uh, this map making a shift that has troubled generation of scholars unable to reconcile mathematics map making and magic in the manner these contemporaries yeah so this is about uh, this uh, journey and but if we construct a map of the religious difference in europe in the 19th century pages uh, 38 to 9 uh, moyer's historical altars provides just as such a map color coded then it becomes apparent that d and his party had carefully steered a course through the calvinistic and lutheran territories and avoid the catholic dominated lands that i had been talking and making their way down from the baltic coast into the central europe along along a carefully selected route that would ensure they they laws in friendly territories and until they reached their destination so this is uh, the idea and so we will not read more here in this the unknown map maker who produced that text may have been working on it at the same that time another map maker came forward that is finis marison a student of peter house cambridge as he describes himself in his opening sentence set off on his journey around europe and that was published as his 10 years travels through 12 dominions so this uh, finds 
finest Morrison, he made a, 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 a journey in, in the same way. Finest Morrison appropriately for a student and is obsessively concerned how, with how much things cost, recounts little anecdotes about people and places. His first account of Prague gives some indication of the tone of his writing. In case of D, we have noticed that he was interested in map making and the time and dates. But now let's see what is the matter regarding finest Morrison. So he went to Prague and there he notes, so as Prague consists of three cities, all composed with walls, yet is nothing less than strong except the stench of the stresses drive back the Turkish, Turks, and they meet them in open field. There is a small hope in the fortific fortifications thereof. The streets are filthy. There be uh, diverse large marketplaces. The building of some houses is of free stone, and for the most part, are the timber and the clay are the uh, are built with little beauty of art. So the the perception of the travelers might indicate their story. So the, if a if a traveler is interested in a specific field, his writing will go in the in that direction. So that we notice in case of D and finds Madison. Fine Morrison became increasingly confident, giving lengthy account of what people owe, the food they ate, their courtship, marriages and practices, marriage practices, punishment, and countless other details. So Morrison gave details of his journey. And with the greater authority comes another more cautious note, a traveler must something hide, hide his money, uh, must sometimes hide his money, change his habit and dissemble his, dissemble his country and fairly conceal his religion. Though uh, more cynically, he warns against the foolishness of being caught in a wrong place with the wrong religious credential and advises travelers to hold their tongues. Morrison gives the details what he has noticed in his journey. And he has mentioned the food habits, courtship and others. And however, also he said that the uh, traveler should talk less and um, and he made uh, the other traveler cautious for making such kind of journey. Morrison and D both traveled across the body of the Europa. So these two person moved the same area or the Europe region. Their accounts are different in tone, content and intent. So content, intent, and tone. The same person, two person visited the same area, but their writing is different. Different in content, different in intention, and also different in tone. That is a issue of comparability literature, how you will be uh, evaluating such kind of text. D wanted to record his encounters with spirit, with the geographical data secondary. While Fines Morrison recorded a random collection of anecdotes, experience, uh, vignettes, and images, readings Morrison's liter uh, itineraries, we lose track of where he is. If we study Morrison, then we will, we can't identify, that means, from which culture he is writing and where he is now in his journey. Although he tells us that it took him two and a half days to reach uh, 
Augsburg from uh, Nuremberg. And his horse cost him $2. His concern is not with a spital at all. This account of his journey is conditioned by his experience as a map maker. As he, uh, we have talked about the intention. So traveler's intention play a vital role in writing. So this intent was map making. How, however, uh, Morrison is out on a kind of quest, wandering through the world in search of adventures. So Morrison just uh, going from one place to another in search of adventures. Significantly, he notes the size and strength of fortification in the cities he visits because a constant subtext in his writing is the fear of attack by the trucks. So in Morrison writing, we, uh, we see that he has been, uh, he has talked about the fortification, the mighty walls, the boundary. So here, what is the subtext? The subtext is that he was afraid about the attack of the Turks and for this reason, Turkeys, and for this reason, he has mentioned the fortification, the mighty walls, etc. in his writing. So intent of the traveler, intent of the writer plays significant role in writing. Then comes another field that is translation studies. Uh, the debates on translation that have raised down, raised on down the centuries have frequently concerned the visibility and lack of it of the translator. So translation studies, so we have talked about journeys, travels, travel stories, and now we are in the place of uh, translation studies. In case of translation studies, that means arbitrary text will be translated in other, um, uh, other, uh, in other languages. So what does it happen? Is the translator a transparent channel? These questions, is the translator a transparent channel? a kind of glass tube through which the source language text is miraculously transformed in its passes into the target language. So through the translation, language will be a medium and with the language, a text will be transformed to another language. This is the work that happens in case of translation. Is the translator herself an element in the process of translation transformation. In case of travel tales and the journeys and the diaries of the traveler, we have noticed that writer's intention play vital role in the content of travel and diaries. In the same way, in case of translation studies, does translator's intent play a role in case of translation? This question comes in our mind. Similar questions have begun to be asked about map makers. Questions that challenge the supposed objectivity of a map and ask what the map might be for what might be seeking to represent. Post-colonial theory has called into question the organization of geographical space, inviting us to consider the priority, uh, prioritizing the starting point, the cultural base of the map maker. So European Renaissance uh, cartographers prioritize Europe just as Freeless, the great Turkish mariner and author of the Kitabi 
Balia gave priority to the Muslim Mediterranean world. So another, the map maker, the translator and the travel writer are not innocent producer of text. So giving the example over here, we have got the intention and Susan Besnett, he has, she has claimed that the map maker, the translator and the travel writer are not innocent producer of the text that we have understood a little bit because in case of travel writing, writers intention play a vital role. Writers culture play a vital role. Writers linguistics language play a vital role. And in the same way, translator, translator's role in translation studies play a vital role. And, and, and for this reason, it is um, claimed that they are not innocent producer of text. The works they create are part of a process of manipulation. So the culture, the thing we read in travel histories, in diaries, and in map making, actually we see not the actual incident, the incident that are manipulated by map maker, translator, and the travel writer. Shapes and conditions are uh, conditions our attitude to other cultures while uh, purporting to be something else. Map makers produce text that can be used in a very specific way. Translator intervene in the in interlingual transfer with every word they choose. Travel writers constantly position themselves in relation to their point of origin in a culture and the context they are describing. So this is the role of this. This is the uh, situation of map maker, the translator and the travel writer. In 1992, the independent newspaper published a map of the new Europe to assist its reader in orienting themselves with the collapse of the communist regime in the East. The opening of borders immediately called into question the very terminology that had been in place of the decades. Finally, it could be recognized that Vienna is in geographical terms much further to the east than Prague, a city formerly dis uh, designated as part of the Eastern Europe. The language of east and west borrowed from geography had come to acquire a political significance just as the language of the North and South does in Ireland. In 1992, the independent presented a map for the better understanding of the readers. And there we see the different scenario. And why? Because this is once upon a time, uh, the area uh, 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 for the collapse of the communist uh, Russia, communist, uh, the, 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 the map was, uh, differently, uh, the map was changed in, uh, in terms of uh, politics or political perception. Willie Docheris captions photographs entitled The Other Side states that West is South and East is North. The independent map offers a new enlarged version of Europe this Europe doesn't stop at Black Sea, the point generally regarded as the most sternly boundary in the 20th century. Previously, boundaries had been, uh, had been many and varied, depending on political as well as on linguistics criteria. Alexander Kingslick, another author, and traces the travel brought home from the East. So I had come as it were to the end of this well going Europe. Now my eyes would see the splendor and the havoc of the East. He had reached uh, Belgrade. So this is the history of map making. And why it happens that, that because of the former Soviet Union was classified as the European state. 
in this mass mapping, Soviet Union has been considered uh, as a European state. Why? Now that it has been ceased to exist its component parts of the de facto part of the Europe too. Though not all the component parts by any means that the map makers see the conferral of European status as a positive attitude. Why? Soviet Union has become a part of European state, of European states. Why? Uh, the reason is that the European Economic Commission states are looking hungrily towards the natural resources set to lie beneath the soil of what were once termed Central Asian states. European Economic Commission and the map maker, they always tried to get Soviet Union as a part of Europe. Why? Because they perceived that there are a huge number of uh, natural resources are in this Central Asian states. And this is the reason they tried to make Soviet Union and the other country as a part of European uh, states. And that we should all now wipe out centuries of conditioning that saw Islam as symbolic of terror, devastation, and the demonic hordes of the uh, hordes of the hatred of barbarism. So such kind of intention also was placed in case of map making. Beside the independent map maker was so concerned with the looking out to the Capsi and sea that Iceland has been cut off altogether. The small Scandinavian island up in the Atlantic has a suddenly and the Atlantis vanished without rest. So in case of map making, we also see the pol some politics. The whole bias of the map is away from Northern Europe towards those areas that were once part of the Roman Empire, uh, Bithynia, Pontus, Cappadocia, Armenia, Colchis, and the Caucasus. The rise and fall of the Ottoman Empire is wiped away with the cartographical manipulation. So in case of map making, we also see politics. Morrison anxiety was based on the concrete evidence. The Ottoman military machine was highly efficient and the annexation of lands systematically, systematic and throw. So we see also uh, politics in map making. Outside the boundaries of what a culture deemed to be civilization, all kinds of terrors lurked, and those terrors were frequently depicted in terms of uh, sexual differences. New territories could therefore be described as virgin land. The notion of a rich orient was linked to eroticism and lavishness. Uh, the bat's eye, the first uh, East are soft, says Shakespeare. Sh uh, Shakespeare in Antony and Antony and Cleopatra, and fantasizing and fantasizing about the sexual habits of the other culture. So, in always the other culture has been reconstructed by the writers. And. Uh, so, in the age of the imperial expansion of the 19th century, the split between North and South widened yet again, with the Ottoman Empire crumbling and the threat from the East diminished and the tone of many writers introducing the East to follow Europeans was distinctively patronizing and pejorative. Moreover, the tendency to describe alternative culture is uh, sexually figurative language took on another dimension. 
E. W. Lin, translator of the Arabian Rites, his version appeared in 1840, announced with confidence a reminiscence of the uh, Tacitus assertion about the chastity German that the women of Egypt have the character of being most licentious. Here it is mentioned in their feelings of all female who lay any claim to be considered as the members of the civilized nation. <gasps> Sorry, this is the way they have presented the story. Thus, uh, faithful picture, the discourse of faithfulness that has so dogged translation studies. So in case of translation studies, whether uh, this right, this kind of writing has the uh, real picture of the original text or not, or the original culture of not, from which we are finally beginning to emerge is also a dominant discourse in travel writing. Travelers have pretensions towards faithfulness, insisting that we believe their accounts simply because they have been there and we have not. So in case of travelers still, travelers went to the place and they wrote that the story of the place. And they are, the traveler are, is upper hand because they went there and we haven't gone there. And for this reason, they got upper hand. But always a question comes, that is the uh, discourse of faithfulness, whether the picture we see in travelogue or the travel story or the journey or map making the story, is it the real story that we are reading? This question always comes past. Len can assure us with confidence that Egyptian women are the worst in the world. This is also translation. Lane translated Arabian Nights. And in that translation, he has presented that Egyptian women are the worst in the world. But though it is a translated work, we, have, we, 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 we can claim about the uh, discourse of faithfulness of the ideological reality or the cultural reality that we have noticed in this text. Richard Barton provide us with the important information that uh, uh, tallow candles were forbidden in harems and bananas were directed. So such kind of uh, description always, um, uh, always gives us the idea that uh, this description as are uh, real or not. Rana Kabbani, and a range of other scholars drawing upon feminist methodologies have started to examine the way in which European travelers eroticize the Orient uh, and transform it into the locus of their own sexual fantasies. So the European travelers, they travel to Orient, uh, Orient culture and they actually have written something that is not real. That is the imaginative story they have written. And that is mentioned that that is the, uh, uh, that is the Lucas of their own sexual fantasies. This is another whole new dimension of comparative literary studies that an important one for as we learn how culture construct other cultures. So this approach uh, has become a more prominent uh, branch of competitive literature that one culture might construct other culture. And how the explicit and the implicit are woven together. Explicit and implicit. So subtext and the surface story and the subtext, the hidden story, how they are linked together, how they have been interwoven together by the writers. So 
we also learn about the manipulative process that underlies us self-proclaimed objective or faithful depiction of reality. So uh, that we have noticed in this today's class that in case of Mushal Fuku, he has told about that two forms of comparison might happen in, compa in comparative literature. One that is the comparison of measurement and that measurement can be uh, can be done towards the uh, towards uh, equality and inequality, minor language and uh, major language. And apart from such kind of measurement, another kind of comparison we see that is the travel, uh, travelogue, that means the experience of the travelers and the voyagers. And also uh, we have got the map making. We have also got many adventures made journey and they have written diaries. This kind of writing has gained a special position in comparative literature. And the writer, uh, Susan Besnett, he has she has presented that in case of journeys, in case of travel writing, we see that writer's intention play a vital role in shaping the content of this writing. Same thing we observe in translation studies. When, a translation, when, uh, when we see a translated form of a writing, translator plays an important role what we uh, get in the translated uh, text. And we see here an example of the translation of Aravind rites. There the writer Len, he has presented that the Egyptian women are most licensed. But always the question comes in our mind that whether such kind of, uh, such kind of uh, explanation regarding cultural, regarding gender studies, regarding central uh, uh, cultural studies and translation studies, one question comes in our mind that whether these are real or not. And in this regard, um, uh, actually when a culture, when a people visits another uh, country or another culture, in many cases, the traveler fantasize the culture on which he is writing. So thank you very much uh, for uh, attending the class. Though uh,